says in Job 38 that the constellations influence you. It names Pleiades, it names Orion, it names Arcturus. And in as much as they influence, I want to find out how they influence. I want to know what the signs mean, I want to know what the names mean, I want to know how they influence. The Bible said that they do. Jesus Christ said, seek and ask and you shall find. Religion says don't do that because you're liable to find something to prove they're wrong, and we have. Whenever anybody tells you don't look, don't seek, don't read, don't get involved, run away from them. That's a cult. A cult is when you have to believe the same thing that the leader of the group or the group believes. You're in a cult. And that's why I'm so happy that I don't know what any of you believe and I don't care. You just do whatever you do. That's freedom. Keep it. Don't let anybody steal it from you. Gemini. You know, you clean this board off. I'm afraid to, <laughs> afraid to use it. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah, it does. Look at that. Gemini. Very, very, very interesting. Watch what the stars will unfold for you because the Bible, before it was put in book form, was written in the stars. Okay? Now, you've got your Gemini. First time we've had a hand out here in a long time. And aren't they cute? Yeah, maybe if you could hold that up there and, uh, and they could get a little shot of that. That's the twins. Okay? In Latin, in Latin, the twins of Gemini are known as Castor and Pollux. Castor and Pollux. Now let's take um, something that's very interesting. In mysticism, in symbolism in the Bible, the word ship, the word ship means the mind. The word ship means your mind. It's the human mental vehicle. It's you and me. Our bodies and our minds are ships that sail and traverse life's sea. And sometimes it becomes quite stormy. If you go back and you remember the story of Jonah, what happened? He could not be saved. He could not be swallowed by the fish, which was God, until what happened? Until he was cast away off of the ship. As long as he was on his ship, he was steering his course. As long as he was in his ship, he was able to row and able to navigate. He had things his way. He could go where he wanted to go. Once he was helpless and floundering in God's deep sea, then and only then could he be swallowed by the fish. As long as you are in your ship, guiding your ship, steering your ship, rowing your ship, you're going to go up and you're going to head in the wrong direction and you're going to flounder on the rocks sooner or later. Once you dive overboard into God's deepest sea, which is God's deepest truth within you, the fish will swallow you and then you'll be safe. That's what, that's what actually that story is about. It has nothing whatsoever to do with fish, has nothing ever to do with water, has nothing to do with anybody getting swallowed by a fish. And I can tell you with, I think, fairly uh, good physiological uh, authority that if a fish swallows you for three days, you will die. You will turn up on the shore, not as a person, you will turn up on the shore as you know what. <laughs> the, Moses Maimonides said, whenever you see something in the Bible that goes against your common sense, stay there. God's trying to tell you something. A big fish is the power of God, the power of Christ. The sea is God's deepest truth. The ship is your mind. Once you get off of that ship and into God's deepest truth, you will be swallowed by the fish. He will place you up on solid ground, and you will be a prophet of the Most High. You may not change your personality, but you'll be filled with God, and you'll know God. That's the story. So here, then, Castor and Pollux, the ship. Now, on page 110 of your little Bibles, and the rest of you looking on at the, the book of John, Going to John chapter 21, you see something very interesting. John chapter 21, page 110 in those little Bibles, and Jesus is talking about catching fish. God, wisdom, spiritual wisdom. John 21, verse 6, he, what does he say? Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and you will find. Cast your energies to the right hemisphere, and you will find. Wisdom, understanding, God. Cast your net to the right side. It's an interesting thing. I've been through with this with you many, many times. But as you know, the, new, the number 
in mysticism in the Bible for consciousness is nine. And it's broken down by, you know, taking numerology, you add the numbers up in the line and they come out to nine. If you look at John 21 verse 11, it shows how many fish they caught when they cast their net to the right side. For all there were so many, it said, let's see, a net to 153, 153 fish. Five plus three plus one equals nine. That's the Bible's way of saying to you, I'm not talking about fish, I'm talking about you. I'm not talking about the right side of a ship, I'm talking about the right hemisphere of your brain. I'm talking about you. So let's get back now, and we understand the ship is the mind directing to the right side. Let's take a look at Castor Pollock, because as you look at Castor Pollock, what's going to be revealed to you in the Bible is the astrological, excuse the expression, sign of the Apostle Paul. Unless you want to take the Bible literally, and if you want to take the Bible literally, then you violate the Apostle Paul who says, do not be a minister of the letter, don't take it literally. You know how many people's lives have been destroyed by reading the Bible? Because they violate it, they take it literally. I've known people that used to open it up, put their finger in, and whatever it says. Do you know how many people have changed this thing? Do you know how many groups have gotten their hands on it and created different versions of this thing? Do you know how many you could get 30 people in here, get 30 different Bibles, and not one of them would say the same thing? That can't be the word of God, because God's word is unchangeable, cannot be changed. Okay. And people say, well, the King James is the good Bible. Oh, no, I like the Jerusalem Bible, the Revised Standard, the good news, the bad news, the upside, the left side, the downside, the inside, the outside. Oh, everybody's got a version. So that's, not, that's not the word of God. When you get into this situation here, you begin then to look at, I do not have, you do not have in your hand a novel, you have a spiritual book. And the words there are written as symbols of deep spiritual truths. And if you take it literally, then as I have said a thousand times, if somebody says they want to shoot the bull with you, you go down and you get a gun. Now let's watch what's going to happen here. And you're going to see the Bible tell you something that you should know about the mind of the Apostle Paul. Let's go to page 142 in your New Testament. For the rest of you, go to the book of Acts. All right. Here you have in the sign Gemini, Castor and Pollux. Okay? If you go to the book of Acts, and you'll come to Acts chapter... 28, okay? Page 142. Now, first of all, understand Gemini is the third sign in the astronomical calendar or clock. Ge uh, Gemini 28, verse 11. After three months, we departed in a ship of Alexandria, which had wintered in the isle, whose sign was Castor and Polo. It didn't say the name of the ship. It said whose sign. Did you see it? Pastor. It said whose sign was Castor and Pollux. Castor and Pollux is Gemini. You can't change that. Now, I'd like you to take a look at this, your chart that I've given you. Take a look at Gemini, and you'll see in the hands of the one holding the bow and arrow the name Apollo or Castor. If you look at the one holding the club, the name Hercules or Paula. And notice they not only sailed three months, but they tarried three days. The Bible was telling you abundantly that this is a reference to the fact that he who was the apostle traveled in a ship called Gemini. The ship is his mind. Oh, I don't know if I believe that. That's irrelevant. I don't really care. Okay. And, and the other guy on the other side can't prove anything. Nobody can. It's up to you to start exploring. It's up to you to start looking. It's up to you to start seeking for more than you've ever seen and ever found before. Unless you're satisfied with your lot after following that bunch all of your life. If you're not, then start looking. Yeah. Now, 
me say something. Let me, for those of you who have come for many months here, let me give you the ancient name of this constellation. Do you know what the ancient name of this constellation is, Albert? Clostrum Hoor. Clostrum Hoor. The place of him who comes. Ha! Ah, what is the place of him who comes into the never-ending changes of the human mind? Clostrum. You know what's in the clostrum? From the clostrum comes the oil of life. It comes down into your body. It collects to the solar plexus. It flows throughout your entire body. It becomes that which is the oil of intercourse. It creates. It then rises by the force of meditation back up to the Father's house. It's called chrism. It comes from the claustrum. That word chrism in Greek means Christ. Where does he come from? The oil comes from above into your body, and then through the meditation when you crucify the flesh, it goes back up to the Father's house, sits at the right hand of power at the right hemisphere of the brain, and gives you new life. It comes from the claustrum. And in the ancient times, the holy ones knew that this gift of life came from the claustrum. They called it the holy claustrum. It then became the holy claus. It then became the saint claus. It then became Santa Claus. Santa Claus comes from the North Pole with the gift of life. You see? You see where this stuff comes from? But why didn't anybody ever tell you that? I mean, you've seen Santa Claus enough, haven't you? He even wears a red suit to show you that it's part of the emotional nature of me. As the devil wears a red suit, because everything red in mysticism is emotions. That's why the bull goes nuts when you wave a red cape at him. The place of him who comes, claustrum har, see, comes down out of the consciousness out of Gemini. That's what's written in the stars long before it was ever put on, uh, on paper. Now, in the ancient zodiac, Gemini were male and female. As the claustrum, the claustrum brings the oil which flows into the male pineal or pineal gland and the female pituitary gland. Female is pituitary, or male, uh, uh, pituitary is female, pineal is male. And from the pituitary, it flows out as a white, white milky substance. And where the mother breastfeeds, she breastfeeds her baby, what is called claustrum. When it comes from the pineal, it becomes a, a, like a bright yellow golden substance. And through meditation, when you come up from the bondage of the flesh, you activate this union that comes as the gift of life, the pineal gland bringing you into that which is the nirvanic of God, the pituitary gland bringing that which is in the spirit. And what do they say? The white substance, the golden substance. And the book says, I will bring you out of a land of bondage, which is the lower flesh, to a land flowing with milk and honey. That's right. That's right. You are never, ever, ever going to be able to understand God until you start to get away from Bibles and preachers and start to take a little bit of a look at science and understand you as an individual. We have nurses here, we have physiologists here, and they can start talking about it because nothing whatsoever can happen within you unless these things begin to function in harmony. The adrenal glands and all of these other things, the endocrines and all of these things have to function. It doesn't make any difference how much you pray. It doesn't make any difference how good you are. It doesn't make any difference if you read the Bible or if you don't read the Bible. If your adrenal gland isn't working right, it's going to be chaos. How do you get into harmony? Up, up. You know, Michelle, up. I am so excited about this. The heck with this. You know why I'm so excited about this? And I, I shouldn't do this. You know, I should wait until like, Mary, younger, I gotta show you something. <laughs> so exciting. So exciting. Let me show you something that, that why I studied for next week the constellation Cancer. Okay? And as I'm studying the constellation Cancer, I see in the tail of the great bear of Cancer. The name of the star in the tail is the Daughters of the Assembly. The Daughter of the Assembly. 
And I look at the right front paw leg of that bear. And the name is Talitha. I said, I've seen that before. A little meditation. I got into the book of Mark. And in Mark it said, the ruler of the synagogue rumor of the synagogue. The synagogue is the assembly. And he comes to Jesus and he said, my daughter is dying. The daughter of the assembly. The assembly is the mind. The daughter is the spiritual desires born out of the mind. My daughter is dying. My spirit is dying. My mind is failing for life. And Jesus goes into that man's house, walks to the daughter, puts his hand down, and says, Talitha kume, rise up, Talitha. I rose up, spun around. You can see, Mark, I think it's 451, Talitha. The star from the daughters of the assembly in the right side, he said, daughter, rise. The Christ has come into your house. Now I'm going to do that again next week. Don't let on. But I don't want you to not see it. See? Because when you look at this thing next week and you'll see the bear and you'll see in his right paw, you'll see Talitha. Now if you're looking, if you are looking. It's in Mark chapter 4, chapter 5, and is that 21? No, it's in Mark 5, and it's in verse 41. Mark 5, verse 41. And there it is. There is the star. There is the daughter of the assembly. And he walks in, and he said unto her, Talitha kumi which is interpreted, damsel or daughter, I say unto you, rise. That's what he says unto you as he touches you at the right side. Rise up. See? Talitha. And you'll see it next week. And you can go out and see it. If you had a telescope or you go to the planetarium, you can see it, Elliot. You can go and you can look at Talitha in the front right paw. She was 12 years old. She was 12 years old. How about that? And not a coincidence. <laughs> Isn't this exciting? See? Okay. And so here, then, you have Castor and Pollux with the... Gee, we blew the whole thing. Oh, God, I hope they'll come back. Okay. Now, in the ancient zodiac, the Gemini, male and female, has chrism because it flows into the pituitary, which is female, and the pineal, which is male. In ancient Hebrew, the word was thaumin, T-H-A-U-M-I-N, which means united. T-H-A-U-M-I-N which means united, okay? United. In Exodus 26, 24, you don't have to go there. It's not one of the big scriptures, but I just wanted to give you an idea. Construction of the tabernacle, there was two boards which are coupled together. They were called thomen. They are entwined. They are together. The pineal, the pituitary, the tabernacle. So in Gemini, we have claustrum, Okay? We have the twofold nature of God, male and female, Father and Holy Spirit. Now, let's uh, look at this, okay? The figure at the right hand side, do you see it with the bow and arrow? Okay? And, and, and I know you're looking at it from the right side. But the one who is called Apollo means ruler or judge. The star in the left is Hercules, which means to labor, to suffer. And a star on the left foot, Elhenna, means to suffer. That which is on the right, the judge, the ruler. That which is on the left, to suffer, to labor. And notice in the right hand, the club, and in the left hand, the bow and arrow. And both are at rest, see? There's not a war, there's not a struggle going on now. And look at the lyre in the center. You see that, like, it looks like a little harp or something in the center there? 
The war is over because the two are together in harmony. The left side and the right side are together embracing in harmony. There is a peace. Sorry. There is a peace, and that's, and that's exactly what happens when this, this occurs through the power of God. Okay, let's go to the first decon, which is Lepus the hare. That doesn't, not H-A-I-R, this is H-A-R-E, also known as the great symbol of the holy day of Easter, the bunny. <laughs> Pastor Hugh Hefner, there you go. Okay? <laughs> Decon number one is Lepus, which is the hare. Lepus is a very, very, very small constellation. Now remember what I said, in every constellation there's three decons which make up 10 degrees each, or the 30 degrees of that decan. And this one is Lepus the Hare, but it also means enemy. Enemy, the enemy. Okay. The ancient astrologer, and Paul had one time qu quoted Aratus, who was an ancient astrologer, whom Paul quote, says of Lepus, below Orion's feet. Do you see Orion's foot standing right above the, the, the star Regal, right above Lepus? The hare is chased eternally. The enemy is chased eternally. Say, The son of righteousness, which is Orion, brings his foot down upon the enemy, but the hare is swift to flee. What's it mean? When the light comes, the darkness flees. Say, The hare is swift to flee. All the time when you try to put your hand or put your finger on that thing that has caused you so much, it's gone. Say, what is it? that causes you to feel the way you do? What is it that has caused life to treat you the way it is? And so that's decon number one. It is very short, very small, and it moves very quickly. It avoids the light and hides and runs and so forth, and that's what it means. Decon number two, and number two and number three are together, okay? Decon number two is one called Sirius, S-I-R-I-U-S, the, the dog. Now that's the dog at the bottom, it's the big dog. See the Sirius right in his snoot? Okay. Sirius is associated in the universe with great heat. Great heat. Hot fire. Virgil said, with tremendous heat, Sirius infects the sky. And Homer said, whose burning breath taints the red air with fevers, plagues, and death. How do, you, how do you use it? What do you say to this day? Man, these are the dog days. Huh? These are the dog days. That means it's hot. That's where it came from. Oh, you think you made that up? Or maybe the church made it up or granted that to you? No. When people had wisdom, they made it. You couldn't do this nowadays. See? It, was, it took wisdom of people who were unified with God to create this. You couldn't do this nowadays because they'd have uh, everybody on w trial for witchcraft if you started to do this. See? But in those days, people were free with God to create his universe. Nowadays, they're in such bondage, they can't even look at it without going on a guilt trip. Sirius is the brightest of all stars. The brightest of all stars. And it relates to the male aspect of the mind. It is the male aspect of the mind, which is Sirius. And it's a very masculine aspect of, of, of uh, what we're doing here. And actually, this is a fact, too. The, you call, you can say, oh, yes, sir. No, sir. Thank you, sir. It comes right from there. That's where you, the word sir, because it's the male aspect. It's the blazing passion of the human mind. It's the male aspect of, of the mind, which is serious. The star in the left foot, do you see that? It's called Mirzam, M-I-R-Z-A-M. It means the prince. It means the ruler. OK? means the prince or the ruler. Now, go with me to the Bible, if you would, and on page 102 in the uh, New Testament, go to, go, to, go to page John, uh, go to John chapter 12. 
102 of the New Testament, John chapter 12. All right? John chapter 12. Now you look at this, oh, this is the prince or the ruler. This is the human mind. This is where the heat comes from. See? When you, when you say, man, I am burnt up. Did you ever say I'm burnt up? Never? Did you ever say that, Mark? <laughs> yes, you did. Certainly we do. Why? I'm hot. Oh, you said, boy, that guy is really hot. I had some people do that recently in my office where some things happened the way I didn't think they should happen, and they said, you better not go over there. He is really hot. See? The mind. The, the male aspect of the mind. You are burnt up. You are hot. You are livid. You are in a rage. The prince or the ruler. Oh, say, well, that must be Jesus. John 12, verse 31. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. That's the prince of this world. The prince of darkness. Okay. Out of the dog, Sirius, the prince of darkness. The prince, the ruler of this world. There is no God ruling this world. It's you and me that are ruling this world. Every time, if I want encouragement that what I'm doing here is right, and then this religion that we've lived in all of these years is nothing but paganistic, superstitious rot, I take a look and turn the television on and look at these little babies in, in Iraq and look at the little babies in Africa and look at the little babies in the United States, and I say, there is no God e existing in this universe except what's in the minds of man. Because no God would allow such a thing. Hideous. And, and what, are they on what are they on television telling you? If this isn't bad enough, he's coming with fire soon with his atomic bombs he's going to give the Russians. I hope someday those people are sat down. And I don't even think if God himself stood on this platform and told them they couldn't believe him. Because you know what? All their life they've been taught that two and two equals five. The prince of this world is that which we call Satan, that which is the red dragon, that which is the devil, that which is dressed in red. And if you'll go back to what I said just a few moments ago, what did Homer say of this star whose burning breath taints the red air with fevers, plagues, and death? Red air. The prince, the ruler of this world. Sirius. So in Gemini, what do we have? We have the hair, the part of your mind which troubles you, but is quick to flee as soon as the light is turned on it elusive, the enemy, and now we have the prince or ru ruler who is bright, but who puts forth tremendous heat, red heat, passion. Where does it come from? Your own passions of your mind, your energies, your, 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 your blah, 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 I'm looking for a word. Temper. Temper, 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 temper. Tantrums, red, fire. That's serious. Well, that's pretty negative then, isn't it? Because we have the elusiveness of the enemy, the viciousness of the male mind. And now we go to the third decon. And if you look right above Sirius, the dog star enemy, you see Canis Minor, the second dog star. And if you look at that small dog, above you'll see the brightest star, right in his little tummy. Do you see it? Prakyan. You know what it means? You ready? Thought it was all downhill? It means Redeemer. Redeemer, Prakyan, Redeemer, the small, insignificant one who is above is the Redeemer. What did I say? The small, insignificant one who is above is the Redeemer. The star in the neck means al Comisi. You know what it means? Bearing for others. Bearing for others the Redeemer, bearing for others. So in Gemini, you see the duality, don't you? You see what is called the yin and the yang. What do you see here in Gemini? And I'm going to show it to you in just a minute with the Apostle Paul. You see the mind in a state of elusiveness. You know what it is with Gemini? You don't know. Your, your mind is going, first it's on the left, then it's on the right. You're thinking this, you're thinking that. It's coming from this side, it's coming from that side. It's confusion. You don't know which way to turn. Running from left to right, spiritually, back and forth, that's the rabbit. 
And then you see the fiery passion which fuels the emotions. That's the big dog. But then you see the little one who is above the Redeemer. And what, did, what does Isaiah say? Be still. And you will hear a still, small voice that says, this is the way. And you turn to the left or to the right. This is the way. So it's a picture of Gemini. Now, you know, so notice what we talked about Sirius, the dog, the evil one. Come on with me. We only have two more scriptures and we're done. Come with me to page 473 in those little Bibles. Go to Psalm 22. All right? Psalm 22. You don't get this going other places. You know that. How many churches are you going to go to get a... Let me tell you this stuff. Psalm 22. Okay? With me? Page uh, 473 in the little Bibles. Let's go to Psalm 22 and go to verse 20. Deliver my soul from the sword, my darling, which is the spirit, from the power of the dog. <laughs> or, as the preacher said, this is very serious. I threw that in. Threw that in. Just made that up. It's not in the side of the box. But do you see where it says deliver from the power of the dog? Do you understand that the Bible was taken from the stars, from the mythology of the stars and the astronomy and the zodiac? It's all right. the, the book of Revelation, the overthrowing of Satan, the coming of the bridegroom, it all comes from the zodiac. Written thousands and thousands of years before these guys ever put this thing together. That's, that is something, you know what? That is something that can be unchanged. And next week, we're going to study about a star in cancer. And you know what this star does? Nothing. It's called the polar star. And it sits in the center of the universe. And every other star revolves around it. And it just sits there. And everything revolves around it in a great 360-degree circle. And it doesn't move. Save me from the dog. What does Jesus say in Matthew 7, 6? Give not that which is holy unto the dogs. Don't give that which is the higher realms of divine thought unto the mind. Keep it out of there. The thoughts of the mind of the dogs. Don't give that which is your spiritual realms. Don't study literally. Don't listen to men's opinions Go in and rise above the doghouse, up to the temple. Do not communicate with that which is the dog. You saw two things. Save me from the power of the dog. And you heard Jesus Christ. I didn't even have to tell you. It's in Matthew 7, 6. It says, give not that which is holy unto the dog. I'm coming. I'm coming. Here we go. I'm a little excited. It's only Friday. You know, do you know what we're studying Sunday night? Reincarnation. Ooh. Invite all of your pastor friends. <laughs> but when you do, ask them, oh, pastor, do one thing for me. Look where Jesus said, do you see that man over there? Oh, John the Baptist? Yeah. That's Elijah who was to come. If you have ears, listen. Oh, I don't think he said that. Oh, maybe you don't. But he did say that, didn't he? He did say that. And see what Jesus is saying? Take no thought. Don't give your mind that which is holy to the door. Let me show you one last thing as we go and wrap this up. Wrap this up. Page 148 in the little Bible. We were showing you this is the mind of the Apostle Paul. Gemini. And you saw it in Castor Pollux. And we saw... That which was the hair, the elusiveness, running back and forth, not able really to know what's going on. And you saw that which is the passions, the fiery passions of the mind. Page 148 in your little Bibles. And if the rest of you go to Romans chapter 7 and go to verse 15. Let's look at Gemini. And of all the things we've learned tonight, Castor Pollux, he who sailed on the ship Castor Pollux, the Apostle Paul. And you'll understand his Gemini nature now very clearly. 
Romans 7, verse 15. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that I do. If then I do that which I would not, I consent that the law is good. So it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. And look at verse 19. For the good that I would, I do not. For the evil which I would not, that I do. Do you see what happens? He's torn. He's doing something. And what is this guy up to? I mean, he's the guy that said, you know, well, he wrote the Bible. What's he up to? Huh? But he is torn between the passions of the lower dog and the divine aspects of the higher dog and the elusiveness of the rabbit and the duality of the yin and the yang. Why do I do these things? Go back to verse 15. That which I do, I allow not. That means the things that I'm doing, I know are wrong. But I'm doing them anyhow. And I'm having a lot of fun. I'm writing the Bible all at the same time. Oh. And that which I would, I do not. In other words, the good things that I know I should do, I'm not doing them. And I don't really care because I'm not going to do them anyhow. But what I hate, that I do. In other words, I come to church and I preach and I say, do this. But you know what? I don't do it. That's the Apostle Paul. You know what's so wonderful about the Apostle Paul? Guts. 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 Tell it like it is, man. Don't hide behind the pulpit. Come out and tell him the truth. And he did. Hasn't been one since. If then I do that which I would not, then I consent that the law, it is good. In other words, I know that I'm doing things I shouldn't do. But so what did he say in verse 17? But then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. It isn't him. He didn't do it after all. All those dirty, seedy little things he was into. This is not me. See? So then how can you and I look at somebody else and say, oh, well, what they did? No, they didn't do anything. It was the sin within them that did it. Take it out on the culprit. That's what has to be overcome. Not the person. That which is the lower mind. And you can take that person into absolute and utter salvation by raising that person above that sin, which is the mind. And then he says in verse 19, For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that's what I do. Isn't he a rascal? Huh? So, now, if I do that I would not, in other words, if I do the things I know are wrong, it's no more that I that do it, but the sin that dwells in. So I find in a law that when I would do good, evil is present. Watch this next one now. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. You should take that one to the bank. I the law, delight in the law of God after the inward. Not the stuff you hear in church, not the stuff you read in the Bible, not the stuff you hear from preachers. The law which comes forth from the inner. This is the same Paul who talked about you people when you come in here on Tuesday nights when he said, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. We did all right, didn't we? Not bad. Well, thank you very much for sharing tonight.